You're listening to Partnernomics Podcast, where we discuss the art and science of developing successful strategic partnerships. To learn more about the suite of Partnernomics solutions, visit Partnernomics.com. Welcome back to another episode of Partnernomics Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Brigman. And on today's show, we have Dina Moskowitz with us. So Dina is the founder and CEO of SASMAX. We're going to have an opportunity to learn about Dina and her company, her career, the cool stuff that, that she's done as a channel leader. Dina, hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. So how are things uh, going out there in San Diego? Things are going well. It seems like, you know, the world is opening up again and um, COVID cases are hopefully down for good and the sun is shining and it's a beautiful fall day here in San Diego. So I feel it's always beautiful in San Diego, though, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky. I know. But I am a fellow. I'm, I'm a New Yorker, so I really have appreciation, especially when the seasons start to turn. So, Dean, I love to tell people that, you know, when they're from San Diego, that I had a three month all expense paid vacation to San Diego. Right. Which sounds absolutely beautiful until people learn that I was a Marine Corps boot camp for Uh, three months. Right. So (laughs) maybe not maybe not quite so exciting. But one of the coolest things that I got to do was and we were just chatting about this is going to amphibious assault school down in Coronado, Coronado Island, which is an absolute beautiful place. So it's right down uh, in, in your neck of the woods as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's awesome. Firstly, thank you for your service and uh, for going through all those trainings. And at least you were doing it in San Diego and not somewhere like Alaska, right? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Absolutely, for sure. So Dean, I was... Um, Looking through uh, your LinkedIn profile, just kind of refresh my memory and getting us uh, ready for this podcast. And uh, I noticed that you have a bachelor's in finance and also Mandarin Chinese uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. That That is intriguing to me. I, I, I have to ask you, um, what, what, what led you, what motivated you, what inspired you to, to want to study those two topics? I was basically young and wanted to travel and wanted to, uh, you know, I was very ambitious back then at the time. So uh, when I went to Penn and was there as a freshman, I knew I was going to be going into, you know, the business component of education, the Wharton undergrad, and wanted to do something else that was going to be creative and, and interesting and very different from the other side of my education. So I sat in on a Mandarin Chinese class and it just grabbed me immediately. It's a very tonal language. Um, the way you think is different. The way words are structured is different. And there's a whole other side of the world speaking that language. And so that just began my journey. Awesome. And so did you end up doing some international travel where you could use the, the language? I did. I did a study abroad in Taiwan. And from there, I got to travel around East Southeast Asia as well. And living in Taiwan, I stayed in a dorm where it was uh, very much, um, you know, women and and girls were sort of kept in a dorm where you had like um, barbed wire around the dorm structure. So girls couldn't get in and out after certain curfew hours, but the, the boys didn't have curfews and they didn't have any walls. So, you know, very early on, you got to see and learn certain differences between how, you know, women and men around the world have are, are treated differently, right? Yeah, very interesting. I can only imagine what an experience that was. And I don't speak a, a second language, but I've heard that whenever you are immersed into a culture and immersed into the language, that's really where, you know, you, you learn to uh, to, to speak the language. I can only imagine what a, what a neat experience that was. Yeah, it was. I definitely recommend it if you have time and bandwidth to uh, take on other languages, but it's, it's a lot of work. So, But Dina, tell us a little bit about your career. I'd love to just kind of chat with people and just learn kind of their perspectives and what, uh, what path they took. How did you kind of enter into the, the corporate space and then what led you to partnerships? That's wow. So that's I'll try to make it really, really short because it, my my path kind of is is very odd. Um, but I did start in investment banking, and that brought me to San Diego. 
And from investment banking, I got sort of that startup bug where um, I started to get involved in multiple early stage startup companies that were raising seed or venture, cap, uh, you know, series A, whatever. And from there, you know, I was in a few of those ventures related to the dot-com era and mostly on the planning and the business development side. And from there, I I uh, founded a business plan consultant practice called Corporate Business Plan Associates. And so that gave me the opportunity to work with lots of emerging technology companies. And I think that was part of, you know, very pivotal for me because I learned to be an entrepreneur on my own, running my own consulting practice initially. And that led me to realize that we were at some really exciting places in techno technological growth and adoption being SaaS in the cloud. And it was when AWS was just in beta and just starting to release um, their cloud-based infrastructure platform. And uh, Azure really wasn't even something you knew, knew as a household word then either. And I started a, for a, a small SaaS company called Critical Digital Data, which was all about data storage. And so that was a, um, a first foray into SaaS. And when I sold that company, um, I looked at what I was going to do next. And I saw this trend of uh, this whole ch world of channel where in order to get SaaS products to market, even though they're easily accessible online, to, to, to actually market and sell any business to business SaaS services still required a sales force. And you can't just leverage a direct sales force that's very expensive. And you can't just do email marketing because that's very, very noisy. And so there is this whole sector in the middle in B2B technology called the channel. And they're typically responsible for 60 to 80% of B2B technology sales um, globally. So when I recognized all that, um, it, it dawned on me that there's an opportunity to bring more emerging SaaS companies to market through the channel and vice versa to enable channel chiefs, channel, sorry, channel solution providers, partners to find these new emerging growing technologies so that they can bring them to their customer base. And that was the birth of SaaS Max. So um, yeah, and then there's a whole thing of how did SaaS Max get from where it started to where it is today, but that's, you know, another story. <laughs> Well, Dina, I'm just curious, uh, you've you know, obviously spent a couple of years seeing this evolution, man, it's just wild to see what partnerships are, are doing now and just how it's growing. I say it's it's finally arrived. We're like a, a real thing. We're a legit thing now in partnering. But I'd love to just uh, kind of jump in your brain for a second. What what have you seen over the last, say, decade plus um, in the channel space and how has it how has it evolved? That's a really good question. You know, some of the evolution has to do with the impact of the cloud and the proliferation of software and as a service uh, tools out there to be able to bring to market. So the opportunities for innovative, early adopting channel uh, partners, solution providers, people who are selling technology to their customers to create value and efficiency and drive more um, productivity and sales for their customers have enormous opportunities that weren't were, were barely even touched on early on. They used to be more hardware focused and everything was either delivered, well, it was delivered physically, right? Through boxes and or discs and, and, and physical. And everything shifted more so to a software and an online and, and digital mode. So that's the number one big change and being able to stay on top of those things or, or learn and absorb and understand them and then disseminate that information to the customer base is really big. The other component is that the channel has shifted. Um, well, there, there's two components, but what is comprised of a channel partner in the past was more so, you know, really a dis, uh, sort of a distributor and a a reseller of hardware components and, and integration of those components. And now domain experts like digital marketing agencies can now be channel partners, right? And so can HR technology organizations and um, business intelligence is now a channel partner. Um, so there's so many different types of channel partners that are emerging. Referral partners online, 
are now part of the channel. Influencers online who are just reviewing technology are part of the whole channel today. So the evolution of the cloud and all the different domain specific technologies that have arisen have created a whole new opportunity for all these different types of players in the channel. So Dean, I know you've worked with a, a lot of different startups and the tech side and the SaaS side. What kind of advice would you give? I mean, it seems like there's so many of these really cool tech software startups, you know, popping up and there's, they just see these great opportunities to, to put a value add together. What kind of advice would you give to these founders, uh, these entrepreneurs that are launching new SaaS companies who, who really don't understand what channel is? What mm -hmm. kind of, you know, speak to them for a couple of minutes of what kind of advice you would give to them or what are some, some ways that they can go into channel conversations with eyes wide open to understand uh, opportunities that are there, maybe even also some pitfalls. So that's, gosh, what a broad question. I could talk for like two days on that. So <laughs> <laughs> I would say if, we're, if, if you are a, an entrepreneur and business owner and you're looking at bringing a new product or solution to market when you're planning up front on how you're going to grow your business you i would say it's so critical to include in their business you know margins and pricing and promotions to enable having channel partners or resellers um, be able to earn uh you know earn compensation to help you get to market um, leaving that out of your pricing strategy is a big no-no um, it could really set your company back and not allow you to price your own, your, your own products effectively to be able to successfully go to market. And uh, so just thinking that building a product, putting it online or selling and, dire and directly marketing is effective enough is, is not a good strategy. Make sure you price and promote in order to, to include partners in that ability to, uh, to earn and, and want to be able to drive drive you revenue and, and create opportunities for themselves. So I think we've all heard about, uh, especially in, in modern tech era of being mobile first, you know, like a mobile first platform. Um, whenever we talk to entrepreneurs and, and different business owners that are launching new companies, we like to share a concept of being partner first, or at least from the very beginning, think about a partnering strategy. Don't have it be an afterthought where you right. set up a culture of being independent. Uh, you were just, it's just us against the world. We're only going to be direct. And then you end up growing into this, this new skin of we're now going to partner. And it's almost like, I mean, it's, you do have to shift the culture. We say partnering is a culture. And if you have a deep rooted culture that is independent, uh, us taking on the world, and then you try to shift that to a, a culture that includes dependence. We're now working with partners. Um, that's, that's painful for a lot of organizations. And so we kind of share this concept of, of being partner first, at least from the beginning, understand how you're going to leverage partner. I think, in my humble opinion, every organization, whether you're a, an army of one or an army of 300,000, you have to leverage the power of partnership in, in the 21st century economy and start with being, uh, you know, and thinking about partnerships first as an initial piece of your growth strategy. That, that covers it all. I mean, when you're starting out a business or, or running a business, everyone can be a potential partner to you, right? Anyone who's referring you a potential customer has, has really taken the action of becoming a partner to you. And so partnership first is critical. It, how are you going to reward that referral or say thank you for that referral, acknowledge that referral or you know, uh, lead or reseller agreement? It's so critical to think upfront, how do you make it so that ev everyone wants to partner with you? And then how do you make them successful? So if you are going to have channel partners, and inevitably they are, they could even be your, your, your tax accountant or your, your lawyer in many cases, your, your investors. Everyone wants to, uh, when they, they know you and like what you're doing, they want to refer you business. And so we have to be givers more so than takers. And partnership is all about giving 
you know, it is, you ultimately get to take, but it is about, you know, giving, trying to give as much upfront and, and make it rewarding for partners to refer you business. I love that. Be a value creator. It's all about being a value creator. And then we get to share yeah. that value. So Dina, yes. let's, uh, let's fast forward up into the present SAS max. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the, the current business and uh, what is it that, that your team offers uh, as a solution? Well, it's a good segue from what we were talking about because, you know, everyone can be a potential partner, but you really want to focus on who your ideal partners are in order to grow your business because you don't want to count on a one-off here and a one-off there and a one-off there. Instead, if you find your sweet spot of who your right partners are, who are well aligned with what your business is and have the right customer base and the right um, expertise to sell your products, that is the start of a great growth tra trajectory with a partner base. And so what SASMAX actually does really well is we've built a data mining partner discovery engine. And it's really the first that we know of, and it's been validated as sort of the first, to focus 100% on finding the right channel partners for your, for your business products and solutions in a very hyper-targeted way so that you can accelerate your path to going to market through partner bases. Um, right now, uh, it's also interesting in that because we profile hundreds of thousands of partners today, we, we can do a good job of sharing with the business team how many prospective ideal partners there are out there for you. So you can say, hey, I want to I grow my base partners, but really, are there only 10 out there in the world that are good for it, or are there thousands? And once you have that information, then it's, you can, you're better equipped to know what kind of uh, partner strategy you want to build. And also, you can better understand the types of partners who would be your ideal partner. So that's what we do. Partner Optimizer is our core platform. We're all about helping um, channel teams and businesses that go to market through channel partners to hyper target and really find who, you know, how many partners there are out there and then which ones they are and then how to talk to them. So yeah. I love that. And it cannot be overemphasized enough how critical this is. I mean, there's I have conversations with people all the time and as we coach them, it truly is about quality, not quantity. It's not yes. about casting this huge net and, and, and literally hoping. Hope is a really, really, really bad strategy. But that okay. seems to be the approach. And we work with and talk to, you know, business leaders, partnering leaders across the world, hundreds of them a month, it seems. And time and time again, the strategy, the default strategy is get this big net, cast this big net, and let's essentially hope that 25% provide value to us. And mm -hmm. what is so horrible about that, and we see it all the time, is the more partners that we have that are not providing value to us, number one, we're just holding them back. Number two, we're continuing to hold ourselves back because we still have to put good effort, good energy, good technology, good money to those partners that really from the beginning aren't positioned, aren't aligned to help us. And we're not really aligned to help them. So shame on them for us not doing our job better. I'd love to, you know, just appeal the onion a little bit and let's, let's kind of talk about how we do this. I mean, how, mm -hmm. from, from your perspective or what's, what's kind of the process, right? So somebody comes on, they become a subscriber to your technology, uh, to the partner optimizer. What does that right. look like? Do we build profiles and then do, does the system kind of look at profiles or is there some intelligence behind the system that could help us through that part process? Sometimes we don't even know who uh -huh. our best partner is. That's right. Yeah, the answer to that is sort of yes to all. And it really depends on where you're starting. If you already have a lot of partners in place, then a great strategy is to feed, feed our engine your best partners. And when I say feed them, it means just give us the domain name, right? Like joeit.com and, you know, um, mark.com or whatever it is, the your, your partner domain names. And we're able to profile those companies and we aggregate that 
into an analysis that says, these are what these partners have most in common. You know, 95% of them are Microsoft Gold partners. And, you know, 78% of them are talking about cybersecurity software or business productivity. And we can, we can tell you hundreds to thousands of attributes about each of these partners and then what they have in common. And so from there, we, the engine shares that information and you can then hone in and build an ideal partner profile that turns into a query. And from that query, we're then able to match up and score either your existing partners that will profile and show you how they stack up against one profile type, as well as find net new partners who match that at a level of excellence or very good or good. And sometimes we come up with ones that are maybes, and then you can eliminate all the ones who are not. So we go through basically identifying what your best ones are or what you think your best one should be in a case that you don't know. And then we build a, a query. And from that query, we then let the engine do its work and, and, and let those best partners surface to the top, if there are best partners, right? So um, there typically are quite a few, but the more hyper-targeted you get, the smaller and smaller the number of partners you'll find, which is a typical analysis. And Dina, what do you typically find with clients that have let's say a quote unquote mature program. So they've had it out there for, for several years. Um, I would imagine like companies that we work with, they're not only looking to add new partners that are right in the center of the target of who they're looking for, but then they're also looking for and needing to uh, probably decommission some of their partnerships uh, mm -hmm. to kind of optimize their program, which means you, you have to set people free. You have to set these companies free that are not providing value to you and you're not providing value to them. It yes. sounds like your solution, it helps both sides of that equation. It does. And, you know, I think what you're alluding to is it's, it's no myth that about 80% of partners recruited today are inactive. They're not driving revenue. And sometimes we see that go up to as many as 95% are inactive. So we don't want channel chiefs to waste their time and money and their people on the wrong partners. That's very frustrating. It's a big waste. Your KPIs get basically thrown out the door. It's hard to measure. And it's really frustrating for a team when you know, you're know you making call after call, talking to partners or partner prospects that really don't even know what you're talking about. It's, you know, it's just... A, it sucks, right? So um, being able to look at and profile existing partners that you have or ones in your queue that might you might have met at a show or ones that are inbound and be able to say, how relevant are they in comparison? How well, you know, how well qualified are they in comparison to what we need in an ideal profile, in an ideal partner? And if they meet certain benchmarks, then yes, let's pursue them rigorously and aggressively and let's incentivize them. Let's go meet them or, or whatever it is. And for the ones that really are not, are, are not qualified or falling short, you have a different strategy of how to approach them. They could be just very young and early and are, are changing and pivoting. And so you don't want to totally exclude them in certain cases, but if they've been a partner on your, uh, in your base for years already and not doing anything, is it because they're working with a competitor really well and therefore you don't need them? You know, you're not going to switch them at this point, or is it that they really just had maybe a deal or two for you and, and they went away because it's un you know, not relevant. So it allows you to really be insightful about who are your partners, which ones to spend time on. And maybe there's, you You might even learn about how to segment your partners. You might find out, for example, like in one case that a good number of partners were actually in a different vertical than you thought. And maybe it's smart to create a verticalized version of your product or do a campaign that enables that set of partners to really focus on their vertical and that could activate them. But once you have information and insight about your partners based upon the business attributes that they are really, um, that, that, com that comprise who they are, you can take a lot more action than just knowing if they're active or inactive. So that's what our engine allows you to do. Dean, I would imagine that with each individual company, does, does your solution, does it um, have some version or form of AI where it essentially learns itself? I'm just thinking there's you know, companies out there that their the profile, although the companies may look 
very similar and be competitors with each other, maybe the profile of their act of their ideal partner is quite different. You know, so it's not really this one size fits all, but I would imagine that as more data is is fed into the system, into the algorithms, that it would have a yes. chance to hone and tune who the ideal partner is for that individual company. Is that accurate? It is accurate. Yep. We, de we deploy, you know, artificial intelligence even, and supervised learning because it's important that we take feedback from each of our customers in order to fine tune what's, what's important to your product and solution. Um, and, and one of the things that, and it's, this is a good myth for your audience to probably know about, which is when you're first building a set of partners that you want to recruit, a lot of times we go to the competitor's website and look at who are their partners. But keeping in mind that not all of those partners are actually active, and most of them are not good partners, keep in mind that there's a chance they're not good for you as well. And so, you know, understanding what, you know, a lot more than just if, is a partner one of your competitors' partner is very critical. What mar what target markets are they focused on? What's the customer size? What uh, geographic regions do they service? What's their expertise? Um, what compliances and partner programs? What's their tech stack? All of these different types of things. What kind of business are they? Are they a VAR or a managed service provider or both, or maybe a marketing agency? The more you can grab and know about these partners, the much more strategic and insightful you can be. And we've seen, you know, with, with customers, we've seen that they're increasing the productivity of their people by three to five X and, and converting partners much faster because they're talking to the right ones a lot sooner. And so it's a really nice trajectory that starts at discovery and takes you all the way through activation and driving more sales. Yeah, I love that. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. So Dina, I'd love to just kind of shift gears a little bit. So you're frequently named uh, an influencer in this channel world and this partnering mm -hmm. world that we're in. Um, I'd love for you to maybe provide some advice for uh, maybe somebody that's getting ready to step into the partnering role or specifically, you know, a woman that's going to be stepping into the partnering role. Is there any particular advice that, that you would give to, to her? Um, of, you know, of how to like build this, you know, re rewarding career and really have a big impact. Sure. So first in general, as any channel professional that's getting started, I would definitely recommend that you do identify those online digital news resources that are constantly um, presenting information about what's going on in, in B2B channel technology. So whether it's the channel company, CRN.com and uh, channel partners, and uh, they, all, they all have the word channel in them, channel pro SMB, um, channel E to E and, and everything in there to be able to follow the daily news and announcements that are coming up will really help you grasp what's going on in the channel and start to identify trends and know what's going on and the beat and how people talk to each other and some of the terms that you may not have heard of. And then for women, um, there are some additional really amazing resources. Nowadays, it's almost like there's better resources for women than there are men in order to, uh, to thrive in, in this kind of sector. Um, there is Advancing Women in IT, which is a CompTIA group. There is a group called Cloud Girls, which I'm in. There's Alliance of Women in the Channel or Alliance of Channel Women, which is part of the telecom cloud and telecom sector. And I'd be happy to point you in, into the right direction on those. Maybe we can put them into the blog post. Um, but there's a lot of support. There's a lot of, uh, there's a, a great book um, by a woman named Cheryl O'Donohue called um, Women in Technology that has case studies of what it's like to be a woman growing into her roles of leadership in the, cha in, in the channel, but in tech and in management and in senior roles as well. And there's just a lot of great inspiration out there and education today for women who want to get into it. And there's a huge opportunity for, um, for channel positions right now because of so many businesses that are uh, getting getting to that stage where they have to go to market beyond uh, just direct sales. 
everyone is needing partnership managers and partnership experts. So I recommend it as a career for a lot of young people who don't realize that the opportunity and the sector exists, but it's a very important area. And it, there's a huge um, career growth path for you if you start in the sector. Yeah, no question. I was, went to university for six years, knew I loved business. I didn't even know partnering was a thing until um, I, I started my career in the late 90s. And as soon as I hit it, I mean, I fell in love. <laughs> I was done. So Good yeah, people there's people land in it. Yeah, oh, there is a massive, massive opportunity right now for, for partnering professionals. And it's definitely a very exciting, uh, very exciting place to be. Um, Miss Dina, one last question before we let you go. That is, mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk to your 21 year old self. If you were to talk to your 21 year old self, what kind of advice would you give her? That's funny. Okay, so. Be careful in Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, go to Taiwan and, and go immerse yourself somewhere where you're totally invisible and irre irrelevant and make yourself and, and find your way. I mean, that's always, it's like a survivor thing. It's, it's, so, it's so good to learn what you're capable of and what's important in life, right? Because, you know, I, I went there with two suitcases and I sent one home in the first week because there was nowhere to put my other suitcase. I had no choice but to get rid of it. And so I lived for six months with uh, a couple of t-shirts and a couple of shorts and underwear and, you know, uh, napkins for toilet paper. And, you know, you, you just learn how to live and, and what's important to yourself and, and to your values. So that's one piece. And the other is um, we don't always, it's very hard to predict what's in our future and what, 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 trajectory your career is going to have but if you plan and if you if if once a month or so or once a quarter you were to write down what you think goals are that you can achieve immediately like really short-term ones that you maybe you have almost achieved already and then what are some things you want to achieve in one year and in five years and then you always go back to them you will see the evolution of your path and you'll start to see trends and interesting pivots that can really help you understand where you're going and give you confidence to realize that you've been achieving things already. And so, you know, it's okay to aim higher and, and bigger and, and uh, taller. <laughs> Man, what great advice. That is awesome. It's, you know, we, we say that whenever we look backwards, our life is a straight line, <laughs> but whenever mm. we look forwards, uh, it's anything but a straight line, right? But I, I love that, just kind of putting these benchmarks of where you want to be right. makes perfect yeah. sense. And very rarely will you achieve the one that's five years out because you'll probably have pivoted somewhere else, but it's a lot of fun to see where you thought it was and then where you are now. Yeah, I love that. Dina, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time. Thanks for uh, sharing the insights with us. Congratulations on your success with uh, SAS Max. It'll be fun to watch you guys continue to grow. Thank you so much. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about the channel and uh, you've, you have already tapped out on Mark and he's too busy, just let me know. I'm happy to, to uh, answer and, and give you some uh, resources and, and help you, you know, build your career in the channel. Partnernomics Podcast is brought to you by Partnernomics. Learn how to leverage the power of partnership. To listen to more episodes of Partnernomics Podcast, visit Partnernomics.com.